All right, I think we'll get started. We don't want to take too much time away from our speakers. So hello, and welcome to the Chorus Forum on Real World Impact of Faculty Publications. Today's forum of over 215 registrants would not be possible without the generous sponsorship coming from ACS, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, SBIE, AMS, Silverchair, and STM. So a little bit about Chorus. Chorus is a community effort dedicated to making open research work. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We work to develop metrics about open data. We improve the overall quality of their metadata related to open research. And we host forums and workshops like today's forum to connect the stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with each other. As our speakers present today, feel free to use Zoom's Q&A feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. They will either be answered by the speakers live or in the QA window. Also, feel free to upvote questions that you think are important, so we're sure to get to them. Today's forum will run until 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and will also be recorded for later viewing. Our moderator for today's session is Rick Anderson. And so without any further ado, over to you, Rick. Thanks very much, Howard. Um, this is going to be a great panel discussion today, and I'm excited to be able to introduce to you our three panelists, uh, which I will do very briefly. Um, our first uh, speaker is going to be Jason Owen Smith. He's a professor of sociology at the University of Michigan, where he studies the interactions of science, commerce, and the law. His book, Research Universities and the Public Good, was published by Stanford University Press. Arthur Ellis is an advisor at Elsevier and has had a long academic career that included serving as vice president for research and graduate studies at the University of California and also as provost of the University of Hong Kong. And Allison Denby is the vice president for journals at Oxford University Press. And she has served in editorial and publishing leadership roles previously at Berkeley Electronic Press, John Wiley and Sons, and Blackwell Publishing. Um, and we will hear from them in that order, uh, following which we will um, have some uh, Q&A and discussion. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jason. Thanks very much, Rick. And thank you all for attending. Uh, really excited to hear the conversation and to be part of this discussion. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Howard? I'm going to be talking with you today about um, an approach to thinking about the impact of particularly academic research, but more broadly, any public, open, published research um, that follows individuals through traces in data systems, including publications, patents, and particularly university administrative data. I'm going to give you a sense of a data system and a consortium of major universities that I'm the co-founder and executive director of, the Institute for Research on Innovation and Science, which is housed at the University of Michigan. Uh, talk about what that does and how it contributes to the larger goals. Give you some quick examples of how we might use that data to measure and think about impact on three time frames, and then hand it off to my co-panelists and look forward to a rich discussion. Next slide, please. So before we kick off into the details of IRIS, I want to start with two papers that we've published out of data or that teams using IRIS data have published that I think make an interesting point for us about the topic of our session today. The first, this one, is a paper published in Science in 2015 that is about the career outcomes of individuals, particularly graduate students, who were trained as part of ongoing research projects that are funded by external sponsors. The key insight here is that the outcomes of research, publications, patents, other documents, serve both to disseminate important information that other researchers and, and people can use, but also serve as a gateway to careers for the people who produce them. So the impetus behind this paper was the idea embedded in the quote from Oppenheimer on the left, 
that if you really want to send information, particularly information at the cutting edge of scientific research with a high degree of tacit knowledge out into the world where it can be applied, the best thing to do with it is to wrap it up in a person, right? And so in this paper, what we do is use university administrative data coupled with data from the US Census Bureau to identify individuals who worked on grants, get a sense of their publications, in this case, in the form of dissertations and the topics and areas they worked on, and then use census data to understand where they were working, what they were earning, what kinds of contributions they made down the road. So this is step one in following the people, recognizing that there's important data about individuals and their careers that can be extracted from the kinds of information we're talking about and linked to other information to really get a quantitative sense of impact. Next slide, please. A second paper highlights the extent to which in that vein, publications are also mechanisms of stratification. I am a sociologist. And so this is a paper written by a team that used IRIS data, of which I was not a part, that appeared in Nature last year, that used data about the full teams of people employed on research grants and data about the publications produced by those research grants to demonstrate that quite systematically across fields, across time, across funders, women in all roles on research grants are less likely to be credited as authors on publications than others. The idea here being that if we wanted to use publications and other data as a way to start tracing the movement of people and the ideas wrapped up in them and to understand some of the impacts that come from following careers and mobility, we also have to grapple with the fact that we need to really understand some of the things about scientific work and credit and the ways in which transitions from contributing to a project to being named on an outcome are important. Next slide, please. In order to do both of these things and to really pay off what I think is a lot of the promise of new methods, uh, particularly computational and big data or um, you know, uh, large scale computational methods to understand the impact of research, I think we need to do a little bit of shifting of our level of analysis. Much of the work we do tends to focus in my world on dollars and documents, grants, expenditures, but also on outcomes that are documents and to trace the effect of those documents on the world. And that's a really important thing to do and I would not in any way suggest we don't. But I also wanna suggest that we miss the fullness of the picture of impact that can be extracted from these kinds of data if we don't also shift our level of analysis to include people their careers across time and characteristics of the teams that are the actual source of the publications and the new ideas. This is follow the people. Next slide, please. And so in order to follow the people, what we've done with IRIS is build a national consortium of more than 40 research universities um, anchored on an IRB approved data repository whose goal is to provide data to researchers and to the public to help understand, explain, and improve the public value of research in higher education. And we do that by building and sharing a new type of data set that is anchored on university administrative data. Next slide, please. This is far too complicated a picture, and so I'm not gonna walk through all of it, but this is the mechanics of IRIS. The idea is that universities join our consortium and they extract from their HR sponsored projects and procurement systems, very detailed transactional data about the direct cost expenditures of all sponsored projects. So for any grant on any one of our campuses, we see information monthly about every individual who's paid wages on that grant, every purchase of goods and services from vendors on that grant, every subcontract. We bring those data into IRIS, integrate them, clean them, link them using a variety of techniques, most of them machine learning or AI based, to a variety of data sources, more than 50, including patented publication outcomes, career outcomes, business data, dissertations, the works. These data are used in concert with some of our partners, the US Census Bureau and the National Center for Science and Engineering Indicators to do two things, to produce a de-identified research release that 
research users around the country and the world can use to better understand the phenomena of interest and to produce a set of analytic reports and analyses that go back to universities and to other stakeholders to help explain what all this work does to the public and others who ultimately are among our key funders and stakeholders. Next slide, please. The Umetrics data set itself has been used by more than 500 researchers from about 150 institutions. And this is just to give you a sense of scale. These data include information about more than 500,000 sponsored projects that cover about $127 billion of spending, and that include information about more than 860,000 people who worked on these research grants and who we make linkages for to understand both their mobility and their contributions and credit on things like the publications that are the results of scientific work. Next slide, please. The idea, and this is drawn from the book that Rick mentioned, is that this kind of data allows us to start to think about impact on three time frames, in part by following the people. In the short term, research funding and the work of academic research has an impact because grants allow investigators to hire the people and buy the stuff necessary to get research done. They create economic stimulus, and we can see that through vendor data. In the medium term, I want to suggest that the impact we see of the kinds of outcomes and processes that we all work on happen as we see people move out into the world to apply the knowledge that they've developed through their research. This is wrapping it up in a person, and it relies on linkages to employment data and on understanding the ways in which, say, someone who worked on a DOE grant at a university, published some stuff, got hired by a corporate lab, and then began to patent for that lab might represent a medium-term impact. And in the long term, I think this is entrepreneurship and the development of work out of new findings. This gives us a way to think about how new discoveries that are embedded in things like patents and publications can become the seeds for whole new industries, new technologies, economic dynamism. Next slide, please. In the short term, some of the kinds of reports we produce focus very heavily on vendors. The question is when money flows into, for instance, the University of Michigan from the federal government, it doesn't just stay on campus, it goes out to buy goods and services from vendors around the state and around the country. And that allows us to talk in very real and very concrete terms and to report on the ways in which the research mission of universities in states also stimulates and supports a state economy that is anchored on a research supply chain. Next slide, please. In the medium term, the kind of data that underpin the research papers I started with allow us to trace the movement of individuals who were trained on research and authors on papers out into employment and to understand both where they're located, what they earn, and what they do to bring value in various ways to other sectors in society. Before the long time frame for seeing a new fundamental science discovery turn into, for instance, a product in someone's hands, um, often we see economic and social impact of the movement of people. Last slide, please. And finally, the idea is that at the core of all this is the discoveries themselves, the knowledge embedded in papers and patents. And those are a key to future economic growth through entrepreneurship, through dynamism, through innovation. You can imagine this in a very simple way, please click. Think about a grant to Stanford in 1994 for what was called the Stanford Digital Libraries Initiative Project. Next. This grant, among other things, helped to support two guys, um, in this case, Sergey Brin and Larry Page, who were computer science students at that time working with the PI of the grant. Page and Bren, next slide, please. In fact, Page is the discoverer of what's called PageRank, which is the core technology underlying Google search. That discovery was patented and also published on. And you can see, next please, that the patent cites the grant. You see a complete link, but there's also other information in the patent. Next slide, please. In the form of the boxes, non-patent prior art, citations to articles that rely on and inform the innovation that also themselves cite past grants. So you can see that one of the earliest 
investments in science that helped to seed Google was actually a grant to a sociologist in 1974. It's SUNY Stony Brook. The other thing that's important here is that there are important things that are missed in the transition from a document to a company, from PageRank to Google. This person down at the bottom corner is not an author on the paper, but was paid on the grant and became Google employer, employee number three. His name is Scott Hassan. And so to fully understand the impact, the idea is that you need the documents, you need the people, and you need the links among them. Next step. Next slide, please. And that's what IRIS does. This is the basic information about IRIS. If you're interested in learning more, please feel free to reach out and I'll turn it over for questions. Thank you. There are Good no day. questions in Q&A at this point. Good day, everyone. Um, I'm going to build on Jason's presentation and try to give you a sense of how data analytics uh, can be used for other forms of storytelling as well. In particular, how to communicate to various stakeholder groups the importance of research, the positive impact uh, it can have on society. And to do this, I'm going to make use of a framework that uh, Elsevier has been developing. Next slide, please. This is a skeletal version of the framework. And it's a holistic way to think about how we might evaluate uh, the academic ecosystem. Starting on the left, we have inputs, uh, which as we've seen people funding uh, equipment to conduct research, uh, the teaching enterprise with teaching and learning indicators. We can think about the research education nexus, both in terms of the throughput involving culture and collaborations, uh, as well as the knowledge created, the outputs with quantity and quality indicators. And then to the far right, the outcomes and impact. Uh, and I'll be focusing on societal and economic impact. We can fill this in. That's the next slide, please, Howard. And we'll focus particularly on 4A in the fourth column. This is characteristics of publications. And on 5A and 5B, societal impact, economic impact, but please keep this holistic picture in mind uh, because there are connections to other parts of this as we think about storytelling. So one of the platforms that can be used is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Next slide, please. This is uh, a graphic that shows the 17 color icons of the SDGs. And these were rolled out in 2015 they were endorsed by all the member nations. And the idea was that the pursuit of these goals would by the year 2030, make the world a more fair and sustainable place. And we're at about the halfway point on that timeline in the year 2023. And obviously we have a lot of work to go to achieve SDG one, for example, no poverty. A number of universities have undertaken what are called voluntary university reviews you see an example from UC Davis in the right on this slide, where you can look through your curriculum, your research enterprise, your sustainability activities on campus, and link them to the SDGs uh, as a way to help tell the story of, of what it is you're doing uh, as an academic institution. Next slide, please. I thought I'd present a use case involving publications um, that uh, was done with the help of a number of historically black colleges and universities to help tell their story. So this is a research overview for the decade beginning in 2013 and running through 2022. And using uh, Elsevier's databases, you could determine that there have been almost 50,000 scholarly outputs from the roughly 100 HBCUs uh, over that decade. And that works out to publishing on the order of uh, an average of a dozen outputs a day. Uh, they involve some 26,000 authors and co-authors. And one of the marks of scholarly impact, of course, is the citation uh, of these publications. And typically citations depend on the discipline, the type of output, for example, a journal article, uh, and the year of publication. And for the distribution of scholarly disciplines that you see in the HBCU output 
portfolio over this period. You can use that data to calculate uh, an estimate of the number of citations you would expect. And relative to that value, which could be set at one, the value you see in the upper right of 1.35 for field weighted citation means that the HBCUs collectively published and received 35% more citations uh, than would you expect from the global average. So that's the citation impact part of this. Uh, there's even more to this good story though, which is that the majority of these publications uh, can be mapped to one or more of the SDGs. Next slide, please. So what's shown here is the relative contribution of the HBCUs uh, over this period of a decade uh, in each of the SDGs that are shown. And that's compared to the US portfolio as a whole. So for example, for SDG one, you could look at the percentage in the US portfolio that mapped to that uh, and set it at one. And similarly for SDGs two through 16. Uh, and so that's the horizontal dash line for ease of comparison that runs across the slide. And then looking at the bar graphs, the you see you can see that uh, relative to the U.S. average, most of the uh, SDGs have larger values, and what that means is that there's a larger percentage in the HBCU portfolio of contributions to those SDGs. In fact, for a trio of them, SDG two, which is zero hunger, SDG four, which is quality education. SDG 10, which is reduced inequality, uh, it's almost double the percentage in the portfolio that you find for the US value. Next slide, please. Furthermore, it's possible now to link patents to the SDGs. Uh, this is data spanning a decade for the City University of New York, uh, the CUNY system. And the circumference of this circle are the SDGs with their color coding. And the wedges that you see are proportional in size to the numbers of, of patent families in the portfolio. The largest one that you see in brown connects with SDG 12. That's responsible consumption and production. Uh, but again, this is another way to demonstrate the connectivity uh, between a kind of publication, the patent, uh, and societal impact, potentially. Next slide, please. Another mechanism for demonstrating societal impact is to scrape policy documents for citations. And this has been done in this slide for the University of Glasgow research over the period of a decade. And you can see that uh, in the column under policies, there are actually several thousand citations to University of Glasgow research. And the policy bodies include, for example, the clinical guidelines in PubMed Central, uh, World Health Organization documents, uh, OECD, and, and so forth. So this is another example of where uh, published material uh, can have a significant societal impact in influencing policy in this case. Next slide, please. This is really uh, a mechanism that is ongoing. Last year uh, in, US, in the US, the Chips and Science Act uh, of 2022 was signed into law. It identifies 10 key technology areas that are listed here, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, biotech, for example. And another uh, element of the Chips and Science Act is that it created a new directorate within the National Science Foundation called TIP. That's on the next slide, please. So TIP stands for Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships. And this directorate is focused on promoting translational research and use-inspired research. And its signature program is called Regional Innovation Engines, or ENGINES for short. And what the directorate did was in soliciting proposals, they initially asked for a very brief concept outline that was publicly posted uh, with the intent of attracting others to join these projects. And what we did was we were able to look at the 700, nearly 700 concept outlines that were posted and determined that about two thirds of them could be mapped to one or more of the SDGs. And that mapping is shown at the, in the bar chart on the left. 
you can see that almost all the SDGs uh, are represented. Uh, the largest number are, are associated with SDG 9, which is industry innovation and infrastructure. Next slide, please. And you can see that uh, as the first set of awards have been made, uh, they occur throughout the U.S. And the intent of these awards, as the name implies, is to really try to establish innovation ecosystems across the entire country. And to the right, you'll see headings that are those 10 key technology areas and the blue squares that you see beneath each of them, each corresponds to one of the awards that's expected to make contributions to that key technology area. And so these are leading indicators of where we can expect to see in the future publications, patents, uh, citations, and policy documents going forward. Next slide, please. Another project that I'd like to briefly describe is one that um, Elsevier is doing with Cornell. Uh, the question we're addressing there is what kinds of relationships exist across grant awards, publications, patents, uh, and commercialization in the form of licenses uh, and startups. And it turns out that there's a common taxonomy using what are called topic clusters that enable you to connect all of these. And a way to represent the uh, outputs of, of this kind of connectivity is shown on the next slide. And these are uh, just the topic clusters that are shown for linking. I think we have a, a sequence if you want to go to the next slide, please. There you go. So we're able to do a kind of forecasting as shown on this slide as we fill it in. Next slide, please. There we go. So the bubbles that you see here represent patenting activity and they're color coded. So all of the patents of uh, a particular color correspond to a subfield. If the field is chemistry, a subfield might be organic chemistry, another subfield might be spectroscopy. The size of the bubble corresponds to the numbers of uh, patent families associated with that subfield. The horizontal position corresponds to the funding that's been received by the campus for that subfield. And the vertical position corresponds to the number of publications uh, corresponding to that subfield. You can then combine this with commercialization data for the campus the licenses uh, and the startups to really have a fairly detailed picture of where commercialization is taking place. And that allows you to investigate how it might be enhanced, what kinds of barriers might exist, for example, and really provide a more informed view of commercialization activity and how it might be grown on a particular campus. Next slide, please. Next slide. This is uh, just to thank my uh, colleagues who contributed to this call, uh, to this presentation at Elsevier and Cornell. And uh, beyond our Q&A session, if you have questions or would like additional information, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email address is shown. Thank you. Um, firstly, thank you for your time today. I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk with everybody here and for your commitment to uh, this forum and also to my fellow presenters. I think as we go through this, we'll see lots of connections um, between the things we're talking about. And I think that's something our industry is very proud of and something that we can make an awful lot out of in terms of helping to demonstrate impact. Um, so the next slide, uh, my email address is there as well, if you have anything to reach out um, afterwards or in the Q&A. Um, so Oxford University Press, uh, many of you will have heard of, our mission is all about demonstrating um, quality uh, in academic research and education. And I think increasingly uh, the key to what quality means is one of the questions we're all asking. Um, you know, we're moving away from some of the standards in how we might measure quality to think much, much more broadly about what does quality mean, how does it shape science, how does it shape um, future innovation um, and impact, uh, however you want to define that, and it's becoming much, much more interesting to think much more broadly about what impact might mean. So to the next slide, um, and it sort of 
Hinge is also on all the things that we've been traditionally looking to in terms of reporting how we perform, um, what we perform, and, and really what adds value to each of our stakeholder groups, um, from our authors through to uh, the institutions that subscribe to our content or uh, the funders who are paying to support um, the research published through our publications. Um, we've had a very traditional way of measuring a lot of the things that we've done, one-to-one uh, -one reporting landscape, but now with the changing business models we're seeing, but I think also all of this data, all of the persistent identifiers, all of the different um, context we can bring uh, around uh, the impact of content um, is going to change things quite dramatically over time and change things in a good way so that we can really see uh, build from um, content that's published in an iterative way uh, as we gradually uh, build on what we know and how we improve what we know uh, for the greater good um, more broadly in research and education. So to the next slide. So we've been sort of thinking um, initially really to how to how could we start to demonstrate some of this impact and value? What matters to the people who uh, we're working with? What matters to our authors? What matters to the many societies we work with? Um, OUP represents uh, the journals of about 300 different academic societies. And what matters in different diverse communities? Um, something that matters in, in mathematics, for example, and the impact of a mathematics paper is very different to something in life sciences, um, similarly from humanities all the way through to clinical medicine. There's very different measures, uh, there's different ways to look at how um, what we're publishing um, improves uh, research overall. Uh, so we've been thinking about the key things that publishers help to do in this world. So my, my presentation is a little narrower than um, Arthur's and Jason's thinking very much in, in a sort of publication output and how do we demonstrate the impact of what we're doing to publish the content that is um, produced uh, in our journals. And we need to do that because we need to show that we're helping to support um, that content, we're helping to improve it and we're adding value. Um, we also want to make sure that we protect research integrity. As we all know, um, it's becoming ever challenging to make sure that uh, the materials that we're using and relying on um, come from a sound basis um, and have uh, very strong, can be trusted uh, for their uh, data and all the uh, underpinning uh, work that's gone into them. We want to make sure that uh, we, you know, we, we help authors improve their papers and that they can decide how best to, to promote their work and what that should do and what that should deliver. And to give feedback on uh, to our author community about how what they publish with us is making a difference. Um, for us, obviously, there's a sustainability question here, and that's not just for us, but again, for our societies. Um, to do all we do uh, has to come at some sort of cost, and therefore we need to make sure the cost of these infrastructure that we're providing and um, everything that we're doing um, are covered. But to really earn anything in terms of payments, we have to show what you're getting for that money. So I think that's um, extremely important as we go forward to show how we are adding value, how uh, what we do makes a difference. Um, and then really to learn from all the impact and the information we have. So there's lots of data out there. And I think that's very evident from Arthur and um, Jason's presentations. Uh, and what we're doing as a community is usually exceptional in thinking about how to collect that data, how to link that data and how to tag that data. Uh, so our initial model Model, uh, that we're working on at the minute is thinking fairly straightforwardly about how do you start to demonstrate uh, the impact of funded content uh, instead of where we used to sort of demonstrate the impact or at least the value of subscribed content. We've got very different stakeholder groups now, people who are paying to publish with us. Um, so we're thinking about initially at least dashboarding um, for many of our funders starting thinking about directly funders, but actually this works uh, to demonstrate author impact, um, the impact of a society, the impact of an individual journal, and the impact of uh, an individual institution, uh, and provide data back. The, the concept, like much of what we do in the publishing community, should be cross-community. And it builds on what Chorus has done in the sense of helping to demonstrate compliance with many of the funder mandates to show, okay, you've, you've complied with what you've done, but how is the value of that um, being demonstrated? So sharing a lot of the data that we already have, um, op metric data, uh, the uh, citation data, um, and also usage data in combination is a sort of first step of what we want to do. This is all data that we have. It's all data that we can collect really, really uh, quite um, economically in the sense of all the persistent identifiers that are very much part of the academic publishing community. 
Um, but it goes beyond that. So to jump to the next slide and um, forgive my slightly messy slide here. Uh, what I'm trying to get across in this slide is, is the concept of all the different elements that we're going to need to understand about content in the future. Um, some of them have been mentioned already. Credit, who was responsible for the data? So if there's an issue of question about the data, um, if you need to get access to the data, where do you go? Um, how can you make sure that uh, we've got all the right people signed up um, to the right elements of the content that's been produced as a measure of trust? How are we making sure that, um, that content is really accessible and adding all the different accessibility standards? What are we doing to preserve um, all of that content? How are we standardizing content so it can be interrogated across our community? And increasingly, I don't think content is going to necessarily sit in any one place. It will be about all the different persistent identifiers and the metrics that surround that content that help you to understand whatever your position or your stakeholder position, um, how that content is delivering a difference and making a difference and what to invest in in the future. So where should we be focusing uh, future research? Where can we build upon research that's already happened? But you know, going back to that, that point of really being able to trust what we're reading and, and understand it, um, and also really understanding the uh, research integrity right the way through the process. So from um, making sure that everything is in place as, a, as content is developed and improved through the peer review pr process, um, to the correction and retraction process to ensure that uh, if there are problems or if science changes, we make sure that content is useful and up to date, or at least uh, we know where it sits in the continuum of that sort of research um, improvement journey uh, as we iteratively develop content. So we're looking at thinking about dashboards more broadly um, that will pull using all of these different uh, identifiers, these different links, all the data that you've heard from from, from my colleagues um, in a central sort of way so that you can start to look at uh, the impact of any individual faculty member or um, a single grant um, going right from its beginning, its inception, all the way through, uh, say, patent or policy influence. So this is the concept that we're working on um, at the moment and starting really just looking at um, some basic data that we already have, but uh, with an ambition to become much more broad in terms of helping to improve science uh, iteratively. And I say science um, in, in the broadest sense, so from humanities again through clinical medicine, all the types of research content um, that is published. Uh, so that just gives you a sense of what we're doing. Um, and longer term, going to the next slide, I think it's gonna be really important. And this goes back to a lot of you, what you've just heard earlier about thinking about how um, we really improve the data and our understanding of demographics. Uh, you know, the point about um, women not always being um, recognized in terms of, of authors. This is going to be key too. So it's part of credit, but it's also part of knowing what's happening right now. These are just samples of early data that we have um, looking at anybody who touches our submission systems or one of our submission systems at this point. Where are they based? How do they identify? What's their gender? Um, what's their race? And it's these type of data that we're going to be able to feed back to those responsible for the research and going back to the you know the, the um, historical black colleges um, data as well, bringing all of this together so we get a better understanding of are we properly supporting all the right communities who can make the biggest difference? Um, how are we training the researcher of the future? How are we helping to support people understand um, uh, how to do peer review? So similarly, looking at the readers on our sites as um, a, prop, uh, a demographic that we should be seeing reflected in our authors um, and our editors uh, longer term. Um, so there's a lot of data around and out there that we're thinking about how do we connect it? Um, what do we do uh, as publishers, which we do quite well in general in terms of working to consistent standards across our community uh, to make useful data to help inform the decisions about uh, future investment in the improvement of research. So that was basically what, where we're at at the moment. Um, we're in a trial on the next slide uh, towards the end of this year to get some, some very basic dashboards, but uh, uh, we want to move into something much more sophisticated over time and work across the community to deliver something that's useful and that will help to make a difference in advancing research and education. So that was it from me. And I'm gonna hand over to Rick, who I think is going to facilitate our Q&A. Thanks very much uh, to all three of you. Those were fascinating uh, presentations. And um, we do have, uh, we have one question right now in the, in the Q&A uh, from Anna Wetterberg. And her question is what type, uh, and this is, I think uh, is directed to Arthur, what types of organizations are included in Elsevier's quote, policy bodies? 
Um, are those government organizations only? Are they policy-oriented think tanks? And are they uh, global or only located in some countries and regions? Are... Sure, this is um, information that, that is acquired globally. Uh, we work um, through Overton um, and their database to collect this information. And so it's, it's really a wide range of um, organizations. Sometimes it's um, the government of another country, um, but if you actually go through um, a, a query and, and uh, see what comes up, it's kind of the spread that you saw on that slide uh, where it, it, it really covers the waterfront in a lot of ways. I, I think probably um, in terms of refinements, being able to get to more regional and local levels is something that uh, may be missed in some of the, uh, some of the queries uh, and is certainly worth working toward because Oftentimes, of course, local policies can be extremely important as well. Excellent, thanks. Um, I had I had a question, but mine was also um, mine was also directed to Elsevier. So, what I wanted to do was ask if any of our panelists has a, a question for any of the others, or for both of the others, for that matter. Well, if I. If I could, I was going to ask uh, both Allison and, and Jason. Allison, on the data you presented regarding uh, DEIA, I was encouraged to see that um, most people seem to respond. You didn't have very many who didn't want to indicate gender, ethnicity, and so forth. Um, that's that's encouraging, and I'm wondering if either or both of you could speak to that. Is is that a trend that we're moving in in terms of people's being willing to reveal more about themselves? I, well, I think so. Um, I mean, I think one, we have to thank Elsevier, who really did a lot of research in the first place to uh, structure the questions around this using um, sociologists, again, uh, to think about how to get an optimized responses. So I think that's, and again, it goes back to the idea that we're um, consistently collecting across the industry the answers to the same questions using the same um, schema. Um, but yeah, we, we have certainly seen uh, a lot of uh, very, very high response rates and a willingness to respond. Obviously, this is dependent on us using that information um, appropriately and protecting um, privacy, uh, which is also very important to us as an industry. I don't know if Jason had anything to add there. Yeah, I mean, I, I will add um, a plus one on the, the privacy protection, something I didn't dig into in great detail in thinking about Iris particularly, but it sounds like for both of your all's data systems as well, getting the privacy security sort of risk versus benefit of data sharing trade-offs right for particular communities um, and with particular communities is absolutely going to be key to this. And we spend a lot of time working with our various constituents around what data fields are available for what purposes, what levels of aggregation, how to use them. Um, there's a great deal, I think, of public good in being able to really understand both the composition and the gaps in the workforce of people who are producing and working on this new knowledge. Um, but it's very important to find ways not to have the costs of that fall on individuals or on groups that are already disadvantaged. And so to that end, one of the things we've been experimenting with in a variety of ways, we try to make relatively little use of direct surveys of individuals, for instance, to reduce burden. So we try to work on a linkage of data to existing data sources. Um, some of those you know, might be HR data. Some of them might be existing national surveys where we can partner. Um, others, uh, we do work for particular purposes to survey specific groups and then link those data in. And so I think the combination of using data where you can that already exists to reduce burden and judiciously working closely with the populations and groups you're interested particularly in serving, it's really essential to the kinds of high response rates that I think you saw in Allison's presentation. Thank you both. Great, and we we actually do have a follow-up question from Anna Wetterberg. Uh, could you point us to the, uh, and I think this is again directed to you, Arthur, could you point us to the questions and schema that you use to collect author info? 
are the questions required, even if they can opt for, oh, so this is not directly at Arthur, but um, <laughs> are the questions required, even if you can opt for prefer not to answer, um, we have much higher rates of non-response, she reports. And I think this probably actually goes to Allison. Yeah, I, I don't have it to hand, but absolutely happy to share. Um, and again, it's work uh, that's come out of the joint commitment uh, to uh, across many, many different publishers um, headed by the Royal Society. So um, that sh I, I don't know if they have it, but if they don't, I can I can certainly share it. And if you want to reach out to me via email, I will find that and send it on, unless you want to share across the, the group here. Great. And unless there's, uh, I would like to register that I have a question when there's a free a free moment for my but uh, there's also a question on q a it looks like uh yeah that's the one that uh that's the one that allison just addressed so i think uh i think it's over to you then jason great i i mean i wanted to start with with arthur's work but also connect to to what allison was talking about i love the move to link the the publications to the sustainable development goals one of the challenges we've had and i'd love both of your your thoughts on this is how to go beyond economic impact and to think more broadly about sort of social impact and impact on human well-being. So think health, wealth, well-being, you know, cleaner air, healthier children, all of the things that we as people care about. And when we're talking to non-scientists, mm -hmm. um, you know, are very, very important, but sometimes hard to read out of our, our pieces. And so um, we haven't knocked that obviously but I'm really excited to see the sustainable development goals. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your broader thoughts on how to think about these less tangible, but exceptionally important types of impact. Sure. I, I think that um, one of the um, aspects of the SDGs that I found interesting is at least in the U S I think there's been, it's been a case that we as a country have been slower to embrace them than other parts of the world. And in fact, there was a recent National Academies report that came out, I think late last year, uh, where they did a survey where relatively few Americans were aware of these, but once they were explained to them what they were, everybody said, sure, you know, this, this would be great to have, you know, no poverty and zero hunger and, and so on. And so I think uh, a big part of this is just sort of making people aware of them. And then also when you can pointing out uh, that they're making contributions to them. I've, I've thought, for example, if you could tell everybody who publishes a paper, gee, you've just contributed to SDG 7 and SDG 3, that would really raise awareness, get people thinking about this and, and the nature of the important linkages, Jason, Jason, that you described. Allison, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's one of those harder things to measure directly. Um, but I know that we, uh, and increasingly there are services out there to help us map all the content that we've published to SDGs um, to provide that content in different ways um, so that uh, we can make sure that at least it's reaching the broadest audience it possibly can to try to make that difference. How it will be measured, I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a matter of time, but it's really critical to measure. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of work. Um, I think it was, it was presented at the SPM meeting about um, content in different um, portfolios uh, and how that relates to the SDGs. So how do we how do we start to really promote um, the access to that content and, and make it widely available and used, which is uh, a lot of what we're trying to do. And maybe even thinking about, you know, making sure that content gets opened up in some way, shape or form so that we can build on it. Um, yeah, not, not a lot uh, to say that in terms of absolute direct measures, um, but I think the more we publish, the more difference we'll make. I think and another... I can also pick up a question in the the Q and A if that's from Alexa. The one from uh, from Alexa Pierce. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Alexa, I think the key to me is is it, it's the trigger has been a little bit demonstrating value um, and impact of when you're paying to publish because I mean one of the potential unintended consequences, and I say this um, carefully. Um, of the move to APC payments is this sort of push towards volume publishing over curated publishing. Um, the subscription model very much recognized curatorship uh, and probably few lower output in terms of the subscription dollars, whereas uh, the shift to sort of um, open access publishing and an author's paid or an institution pays to publish or a funder pays to publish doesn't really, the, the, fund, the money is coming from various sources. Uh, 
has the potential uh, to drive the volume as an economic driver. And I think that's where we wanted to be um, partly as part of the university, but partly very much as a, as a, as a community of stakeholders that really cares about quality and impact and, and making a difference in research and education and um, driving that difference. We didn't want to undermine, we don't want to undermine the economic value of that difference, um, but we felt we were gonna need to be able to show how, um, what your uh, funding pays for, whoever that um, stakeholder might be, um, is actually a value to you and that we're delivering that value. Basically, you gotta show you get something for what you pay for it, right? Um, so that's sort of the underpinning um, challenge. So, it doesn't really matter for us um, what what model um, is in place. Um, however, what does matter is we have to make sure that we are covering our costs um, and we also have to therefore deliver value um, in return. So that's a sort of concept. Um, the business model is somewhat agnostic. Uh, the key to us is making sure there's a sustainable way uh, to advance research and education through our publishing. Does that, I hope that answers the question, Alexa. Happy to follow up later if, if there's more. Thanks, Allison. We do. Uh, we have another another question for Anna Wedderberg, and, and I want to register that she's feeling a little self conscious about having asked multiple questions. But we don't we don't have a lot of other questions rolling in, and and I think this is actually a, a really key question. So I do want to throw it out. Um, the SDGs are very useful for com for communicating focus of research, but do they really demonstrate impact, or do they demonstrate potential impact? I think anybody who wants to pitch in on that one would would be very uh, very interested in hearing your perspectives. So I, I could take a first crack at it if, if you like. That is, you can really drill down on the SDGs. Um, I presented the seventeen um, icons for them, uh, and within each of those, there are targets and and indicators that are really, in many cases, more quantitative in in terms of what people are trying to achieve. So I, I think it's a question of how they're used. And I, I know that there are governments that really are framing uh, their research investments around these, trying to achieve particular objectives for their jurisdiction. Um, so I, I think it really is a question of how deeply one wants to go uh, into their use. But it's from my perspective, it's great to have that kind of framework uh, as a reference point. And I'll, I'll, I'll add, some thoughts I think are wholly complementary there. Um, I'm excited to see them and have sort of toyed with using them myself. One of the reasons I'm really interested in them is because I have, um, and Iris is built around the idea that finding more and more interesting ways to understand how things that could potentially have impact make it out into the world and get used. So beyond a citation-based measure of impact in some sense right. is really important. We've placed a lot of analytic bets on this notion of embedding in the person or following the person. And so what we're interested in there is things on the order of being able to say, okay, this set of people conducted research that is associated with these development goals. Now let's see where they land and what they're working on. Are they bringing their research to, you know, policy analysis in a government? Are they bringing their knowledge and expertise to a nonprofit organization in the U.S. context working on a particular issue so that you can see both the sort of the, the tags, if you will, of what could be seen and get a nearer term sense of, of how some of this knowledge might play out on the ground. That requires um, significant work to get to good measures and significant engagement with the, the various communities. And it's not going to be a one size fits all. But I think without this kind of potential impact measure, you end up very much at sea because, you know, everything could be an impact. And uh, I think some some bounds are very useful to start that process. So it sounds like so far, the feeling is these really are measures of potential impact, but as such, they are nevertheless quite valuable. Is that is that a fair representation of what uh, you guys have said so far? I think from my perspective, yes. Yeah, and I, I, I think from, from mine as well, and the key question becomes, how do we think about 
the rates and directions and trajectories by which that potential impact gets transformed into, right. you know, effect. And some of it may be in policy. So the Overton data is another interesting route to this to think about application. I, I would also mention that um, I think it's University of Glasgow has, in a sense, sort of inverted the process, and and uh, they have had centers form around trying to address particular SDGs. And so I think that that's something that a campus could consider as well, uh, say we're going to focus on a particular issue that's that's associated with an SDG. So it, it sounds like where, where we where we jump from potential impact to actual impact, a lot of that is it's to some degree inferential, right? I mean we see we see that research is cited in a UN report or whatever. And assume that it, since it was cited, it likely had some effect on the outcome of the report or the decision. Mm -hmm. And and that seems like a reasonable assumption. Yes. Allison, oh, yeah. did you have anything you wanted to add on that? Jason, you were going to say something. I was just going to say I, I I think that's right. I mean, analytically, as a speaking as a researcher one of the key sets of questions that people like me put data like these to use for is to try to understand what can we use to constitute a good tracer condition for seeing that citations have been broadly used but mm -hmm. co-employment co-authorship you know topics moving uh, originating in a paper and moving into a report without citations um, there are a wide range of, of of things, and they vary depending on the substantive kind of impact you're looking on. But focusing on that tracer, how these things move, and particularly yeah. how they move across sectors and across, if you will, domains of presentation, I think is one of the key analytic challenges. Excellent. Well, with with that, we seem to be out of audience questions, and I think we are also just about out of time. Um, Howard, did you want to wrap up? Yeah, um, that's been an amazing session. Lots of great questions from both the, the panel as well as from our attendees. So much to think about. So first of all, a huge thank you to all of you who have uh, been speaking with us today, and also a big thank you to our sponsors, ACS, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, SPIE, AMS, Silvachair, and STM. We hope that you found this session very interesting and informative, and we're going to share the video and presentations in a few days. Uh, there will always be more Chorus events coming this year and next year, which you can see on our events. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week, and again, big thank you to everyone.